name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. So one of the weekly high points uh, is the Thursday morning gathering that we have here at St. James. At 7.15, we uh, gather in the side chapel uh, for a Eucharist uh, led by Bishop Gulick, uh, Bishop and Canon Gulick, and then we uh, head to the parish hall for a discussion uh, about the readings for this upcoming Sunday. And uh, this past Thursday, one person uh, asked a pretty uh, insightful question. Why is this first lesson, why is this story uh, of David in the Bible? And you start to think about it. You realize we do kind of polish our heroes, our founding fathers. Uh, we have uh, narratives of them chopping down a, a cherry tree and, and, and owning up to it or throwing a coin uh, you know, across a body of water. Uh, we enlarge our heroes. And here you have King David, greatest of all the kings. Two of the last three weeks, we've had stories about his shortcomings. Why? Is it for the ultimate redemption of David, or is it because it is incredibly human? All of us have been gifted with an incredible gift, the freedom to follow God or the freedom to choose uh, our own devices, our own vices, the things that pull at us that are apart from God whether it be power, whether it be lust, uh, whether it be money, whatever it is, uh, we have the capacity to choose that or choose the other. And so often, even King David is susceptible. Even Jesus is susceptible. Uh, you remember when Jesus was tempted uh, with, with power and, and all of the things that come with being, uh, with being Jesus, the Son of God, uh, and he has to... And he has to say no, just like he had to say no in this story uh, when they want to make him king. Uh, and he knows uh, the allure of that uh, and what that could mean. So David is trapped uh, with the power uh, of the crown. He's isolated by the power of the crown. And I don't even think he realizes in the moment what he's done. It's not until next week's story, which you'll have to tune in next week to get the rest of the story. Uh, but I think it's important that, uh, that God uses these incredibly human people. Because God uses us. And I can only speak for myself and say I am profoundly human. But we do have these stories buttressed against each other. Uh, the story uh, of, of, of David breaking several laws and even having a man murdered uh, for his own lust. Uh, and the story that every gospel captures, the story of the feeding of the 5,000, one of the favorite stories in all of scripture, and they're buttressed against each other. And I don't think it's by accident. I think sometimes life is like that. Sometimes uh, our most depraved moments are buttressed up against the opportunity for grace, redemption, and healing. The epistle for today talks about Filled with God. It has such a beautiful uh, image of abundance uh, that, that uh, Paul's prayer for his people is that they would realize the enormous breadth of God, the breadth, width, depth of God that is beyond our comprehension, a love that is beyond our understanding, and that we would be filled with the fullness of God, that we would be filled with the fullness of God. And then that image of the feeding of the 5,000, where people are hungry in so many ways, and they come, uh, and Jesus fills them with the fullness of God. Not just bread and loaves, but with the fullness of God. Bishop Gulick on Thursday uh, actually beat me to the punch. Uh, there had been a story that had been uh, really weighing on me. Uh, it's, a, it, it's a story that I preached exactly 10 years and one week ago uh, this Sunday. Um, it is the story of incredible depravity and even more incredible grace and fullness of God. It's a story in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, October 2nd, uh, 2006. Uh, and a uh, man who was broken 
uh, who was suffering the loss of a daughter, who was angry with God, entered an Amish schoolhouse, dismissed the teacher, and held the students captive, bound the 10 female students, and then eventually released the boys. And by this point, the, true, uh, the, the police had come, uh, and he opened fire on the girls, killing five of the 10 and wounding all of them. Depravity. The absence of God. But in that moment, in that day, within hours, people from the Amish community went to the house of the, uh, of the gunman, who was not a, an Amish person, uh, went to the house uh, with food for the now widow for the now at least orphaned of a father, children. They announced their forgiveness. Their forgiveness was no easier than our forgiveness, but they disciplined themselves to forgive and then follow it with their life's actions, to make the commitment to forgive the very day within hours of their community being struck like it had never been struck before. And then of the 75 people present at the gunman's funeral, which obviously included uh, his mother, his wife, their children. Almost half of the people in attendance at the funeral were from the Amish community, many who just laid to rest their own daughters and granddaughters. They were there shoulder to shoulder with this woman who also was going through unthinkable grief, a kind that's even more complicated. And it wasn't just lip service, and it wasn't just... Uh, hollow actions, uh, they diverted a lot of uh, the funds that, that came in, uh, relief funds that, um, uh, that as the whole world watched this story, uh, they sent money to help with the medical bills in the Amish community and all the other uh, expenses, uh, but they diverted a lot of those resources to this family for the support of these children that wouldn't have a father to the cost of laying this man to rest. And they continued to practice this discipline. In fact, in one healing story, the mother of the gunman every week would go and help take care of, um, of a girl who was five at the time, uh, now would be 17, who was resigned to a wheelchair and a feeding tube and would spend one day a week caring for this child. And the Amish community cared for this mother who had lost her son. It's a profound story, and it's based on Scripture. Forgiveness isn't just uh, on the menu of being Christian. It is at the heart of it. When they pray the Lord's Prayer every Sunday, they pay particular attention to that. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Your awesome forgiveness should look like our forgiveness. And they live into it. They breathe in all that they do, the fullness of God, and it transforms them. Not in a moment. They're still susceptible to the same anger and revenge uh, and sinfulness of all of us, but they discipline themselves towards the fullness of God. In fact, they have a practice uh, where twice a year, uh, sort of their Lenten season, they deny themselves the Eucharist. They don't come to worship. Well, they think through who has wronged them and who they have wronged, and they rectify that. They reconcile before they are able to receive again. Why was that story on my mind? About ten and a half years ago, Bishop Gulick recommended the book Amish Grace, which was a phenomenal book uh, uh, written by a theologian who was trying to make sense of what seems so countercultural, their response. Uh, and it was a profound book, uh, so much so that I preached on it uh, 10 years and one Sunday ago. And I remember as I started uh, the church service, uh, a single mom who was part of the congregation and her five-year-old uh, daughter who was getting ready to start kindergarten came into church about five minutes late and walked up the center aisle uh, and took their seat. Uh, I know that because 10 years ago on the 25th, 
one of the hardest days of my ordained life took place. I was in a meeting room in our, uh, uh, in our reception room for our mission trip that was getting ready to go to Belize, and I left my cell phone in my office figuring I was at the church and anybody could reach me uh, would be able to, um, and all of a sudden uh, the physician who was also going on the trip, uh, his phone kept ringing and he finally took it and I saw the color leave his face and he looked over at me uh, and he handed me the phone and a gentleman who was trying to outrun the police on a long straightaway where he could see clearly in both directions put his foot all the way to the floor and plowed through this woman, her five-year-old daughter, and their niece as they were walking across the street to the natatorium at University of Louisville. Both girls were killed instantly and the mother survived. And so I'm driving to the hospital with no words, no idea what I would find, no idea what I would say. And my phone by this point is ringing again and again as everybody's seeing the story on the news. And I get there and I walk into the hospital room at University of Louisville and she looks at me, the mother, and she says, I can't stop thinking about that sermon and how those Amish people were able to forgive. It's not easy. That was her first thought, her first words. And while she didn't do it for her own sake, I can't help but think her ability to move on, uh, and you never move on, but her ability to heal as much as a mom can heal was based on her ability to fall into that discipline of forgiveness right then and there, to be filled with the fullness of God instead of the brokenness that each one of us brings. Jesus was gathered by all of these people desperate to be filled by the fullness of God. On a green space, he sat them all down, and he took bread, and he gave thanks and blessed the bread, and he broke the bread, and he gave them the bread. The very thing that we will do in a few minutes, except it's not bread and it's not fish. It's the fullness of God. It's the love that passes all understanding that will be taken, that will be blessed, that will be broken, and that will be given to each of us so that we can live in the fullness of God. Amen.